Well, hi, my name is Bay Logan. Welcome to the Premier Asia DVD release of the modern horror classic, Ju on the Grudge 2, from the writer-director Takashi Shimizu. Takashi Shimizu, born 27th of July 1972 in Maibashi City, Gunma Prefecture in Japan, and started off working as a writer and director on a 1998 TV series, Gakko no Kaiden-ji. He's really quite a character by all accounts. Uh, even though he's making these quite horrific films, he moonwalks between shots and is known to scream like a cat and learnt most of the English phrases he can speak from watch repeat watchings of the movie Star Wars, the original movie Star Wars. And he shot the original video version of The Grudge in the year 2000 and a sequel later the same year, and then remade different ver slightly different versions of the films, part one and part two, on film. And this is part two, this is The Grudge part two, but there had already been uh, two Grudge movies shot very cheaply on video, which was subsequently remade, and then in turn, a big screen Hollywood remake with Sarah Michelle Gellar in the lead role. And uh, here we see these two, actually, the, the, the players that we're seeing here actually do look like actors. If you look at the first movie, most of the people actually seen in the film look like regular folks. And here we actually have, for the first time in the series, actor-looking, people look like actors. The lady is uh, Noriko Sakai, who is a very popular actress and singer in Japan. She's married now to a professional surfer, and originally refused this role because she's never really done horror films before. But the director wanted to change her image from being this cute little uh, cutesy girl type star to a more mature lady. And so uh, he persuaded her and uh, she had a great experience making the film with Takashi Shimizu. And the actor Masa Masashi is the actor Wataro Saito. Uh, this is her boyfriend in the movie. Interesting thing you notice when you're watching the movies of Takashi Shimizu is the way that quite often the POV is kind of from some anonymous third presence. Normally when you see a POV in a movie, it's actually indicating somebody watching a specific action, like this POV shot here. It's very hard to see whose POV this is. It's kind of an anonymous presence that's following them. And as ever with his films, they're kind of to told out of sequence. It's uh, kind of a non-linear storytelling. So at this part of the film, they've already been to this famous house where evil dwells, and have in doing so, picked up the curse or the grudge and are carrying it with them. So this reflects the, the, the kind of the shift in camera movement here. This sense of unease reflects the fact these two people have been to this place and walked away with the evil attached to them. And uh, Juan itself is actually a term made up by Shimizu and the producers of the films, and it consists of the root word or symbol for curse, which is ju, from juso or jubaku, which both mean curse, and they combine that with the word for grudge, which is enkon or ikon, so you get juon. But juon is not in itself uh, a, a generally used term in the Japanese language. It's very specific to these films. And here we see, uh, in a moment, one of the avatars of the grudge, which is this black cat. And uh, the cat actually has a name. The cat's called Ma. The cat is actually uh, the pet of this little boy who died in the evil house, and the boy and the cat, their souls have become fused. So we always see the cat and this little boy in his underwear as like an avatar. Black cat actually is not considered bad luck in, in uh, Japan as it is in Europe and America. But the color black is, its, is itself unlucky because it's the color of funerals and death. And so Ma is actually was the, the pet cat of Toshio, whose feet we see walking in the shot. Toshio is this very spooky, creepy child who uh, is like a constant figure who is in the uh, both the first... Juon movie and this, and also is in the American remake of The Grudge, all uh, played by the same actor, by the same young actor, uh, Yuya Ogiki. And it's um, in the original films, there was another actor. In the original video versions of The Grudge, part one and part two, the Juon movies shot on video, there was a different actor. But Yuya Ogiki has played the role for these films and for the Hollywood remake. At the time of his death, Toshio was six years old, which is um, kind of, is, is hard to use the same actor. When you look at uh, the Grudge, the American version of The Grudge, Yuya is obviously a few years older than that, but this is like, I guess, the fact that he's, uh, we're in this kind of fantasy environment, so anything can happen. But here is him in the way we normally remember him as this figure who keeps turning, this apparently innocent figure, but who's actually conveying the terrible evil, the grudge that has kind of befallen the house where he and his mother were horribly murdered by his father, her husband. This is a cheap way to shoot a car crash. Um, I don't know whether this was a stylistic choice or because they didn't have the money to actually crash the car, but you actually have them going out of shot, and then here it is sitting here, and uh, quite a, that we've established in the early part of the scene that this character, who's actually a horror movie actress, the, the, the character Kyoko Harase, the girl here, is uh, pregnant. 
So we're going to get a payoff in this scene, which will be developed throughout the film, the idea of evil being like reborn. Interesting thing about the actress, Norika Sakai, I'm presuming she's probably a Christian because she gave a pendant of the Virgin Mary to the director for safety. So either she's a Christian herself or she felt that some foreign god might protect him from the evil spirits he was generating uh, making the Juan films. Incidentally, when they start shooting these movies, and ind indeed when they did the American remake, they actually had a Shinto priest come in and bless the production at the beginning because they were worried about stirring up any evil spirits. The handprint you saw on the window, that's kind of echoing something you saw in both the original Grudge and in the American remake, which is the footprints of uh, Toshio, which you're seeing going across the floor in the house. And here we have the handprints on the windshield. And this obviously indicating that she's lost Masashi's child, which is the baby that she was carrying. Um, Noriko Sakai, this really is a change of pace for her. She's had a long career both in TV and movies in Japan. Uh, she made her name in um, such TV shows as Under One Roof. And uh, she was in the, um, her most recent movie prior, to, the most recent TV series prior to Ju on the Grudge was Toshi Tomatsu Kaga Hyaku Mangoku Monogatari, which is uh, a was a popular Japanese t television series. Japanese television series work very well throughout Asia and uh, particularly in Hong Kong. So here we are in this kind of gray urban location. And this is something that we always see in the grudge movies where we're used to seeing horror normally expressed maybe in a spooky castle in Transylvania. What uh, Takashi Shimizu has done is actually bring horror into modern Japan and found these very gray, mundane, urban locations. And so we have... Um, you know, the setting of the hospital here and the place, obviously, where there's a lot of tension The uh, when, when somebody's as seriously ill as Masashi is because he's been thrown into a coma by this, by this environment. Um, Masashi's mother, the actress here who's carrying the bag, who's playing the, the mother, it actually is um, the, the actress who we see with the back to the camera, I'm sorry, who's playing Masashi's mother, is actually slightly, I think, slightly too young for the role. Uh, her name in the movie, her character name is Karo Ishikura, and the actress's name is Shinobu Yoshiro. And she's uh, a very good actress, but to me, when I look at her, slightly too young to be believable as Masashi's mother, because he's quite evidently a mature man. But uh, she's doing a, has a, interesting, the performances are interesting. Some of them are slightly off kilter, and I always wonder, I feel I'm reminded sometimes of those I mean, they used to have shows on in TV in England where they would recreate real crimes. Uh, there was Crime Watch, and they would actually have even maybe the people who had participated or been like bystanders in a crime acting it out. So you would not get professional performances. You would get very amateurish performances, and in a way that made them quite powerful. And in the first grudge, that's something I felt the performances were not very polished, and maybe intentionally so. In this movie, you have a mixture. Some of the performances are polished and some are not. I felt that... Uh, the actress we saw just then uh, playing the mother of, uh, of Masashi was actually particularly, uh, was, was not perhaps as polished as some of the other players in the film. And again, the appearance of the shock appearance of Toshi. I have to say, when I first saw the first film, his constant appearances did scare the bejesus out of me. Now I guess we're kind of used to it, so the shock value isn't quite there, so we see. And uh, here's like the, uh, the home of uh, the actress played Kyoko Harase, and of course a lot of Japanese people actually do live with their parents even after they achieve any levels of success. The actress here playing her mother, uh, the character name is Aki Harase, and she's played by uh, Kaoru Mizuki. And you see actually in the, in the middle of the, it's quite a prominent prop, you see this uh, table here, it's a kotatsu, which is a heated table you see in the middle there. And behind those black and white pictures, what Dylan Thomas called the dicky bird watching pictures of the dead. So you feel a sense that death, you actually feel this in, in a lot of Japanese homes where you have a lot of photographs of uh, previously deceased relatives. And so there's a sense of the dead watching you. And I think that this is something that uh, Takashi Shimizu kind of speaks to in his films, the idea that you're surrounded by the presence of people who've gone before. And in this case, if they are evil presences, then they will affect the living. But anyway, that's the katatsu. Another issue that goes through the, these films is the uh, sense of abandonment. And uh, in the first film, there was the old lady abandoned by her family. And here, uh, we're going to see the daughter abandoned by her mother. And I think this theme of isolation, of Japanese society being increasingly isolated, runs through the work of, uh, of, of Shimizu. And also transferred very well to the American remake of The Grudge because you had these Americans who were adrift in Tokyo, couldn't speak the language, couldn't read Japanese. So I think it worked very well in that instance. The, um, we're really um, 
there's always like this kind of subtle playing in Japanese movies. They never state what they can imply, and so you get this these people, these husband and wife here, who are really unable. Sorry, this uh, mother and daughter who are unable to communicate in a kind of a very expressive way about this trauma that's just happened. So everything's just like below the surface, which is uh, what. I think is the great strength of Takashi Shimizu is everything seems to be mundane and normal, and in reality, just beneath the surface, there's this true, this this genuine horror. Um, the, it's a quite a nice idea having uh, the actress who's experiencing genuine horror. The character Kyaku Harazi, played by Noriko Sakai, is actually somebody who's done many horror movies, so she's like a, a horror movie. Um, kind of scream queen and now she's actually placed into that genuine environment and that's something of course that several American films have played with as well some of the other films that uh, Noriko Sakai has been in or television series was uh, Diatakoro no Kimi di Ite she's uh, also in a TV series Hoshi no Kinka and uh, Hitotsu Yane no Shita too and in Seija no Kaushin and none of these have Japanese and none of these have English translated titles so I'm giving you the direct Japanese and she was in a movie called Hana no Oido no Tsuribaka Nishi and also was like a narrator for one of the Pokemon movies, Pokemon, Pichu and Pikachu. She was narrating the Japanese version. Obviously, they had an English narrator when the, uh, that Pokemon, Pokemon movie, the Pocket Monster movie, was actually released in the, uh, in the U.S. And again, this, the mundane nature of, of horror as you're in this kind of very bland uh, corridor, but it's somewhere where anything could uh, could happen. And I think this makes it all the more horrible because, I mean, sometimes when you do see movies set in really remote locations, like if an alien movie when you're in outer space, there's a sense of distance because you feel probably you're not going to go into outer space, at least not in this lifetime. But I think it's very possible that people could look at the, um, the environments used in these films and actually see uh, places that, you know, they go in their everyday life. And they, it's easy to imagine that you might have a similar experience, uh, an encounter with the undead, uh, somewhere like this. Um, interesting to note the detail. I mean, a lot of the times what you see is an actual location in Tokyo, but when they have to do any kind of major effects work, it's actually on a set, and they go to great uh, lengths to recreate a very ordinary backdrop on a movie location at the Toho Studios, normally working at Toho Studios in Japan. And so they they actually build the set, but they do it with great detail so that it's very you, you have no sense that you're not actually on the actual environment. And again, this, uh, and there she gets her first scream, bona fide, second bona fide scream in the movie. The first one was in the car, and that's Noriko Sakai actually becoming a, a scream queen. And then we realize that this is actually a movie within a movie. And the girl who just screamed is Chiharu, who is a movie extra, played by the actress Yui Ichikawa, and somebody else who we're going to see in the kind of non linear storytelling of the piece. And uh, the first AD scolding her for screaming out of turn. So we have like this, uh, the idea that this scream queen is going back and forward between acting in a film which has the supernatural and in her real life, in her real life with confronting uh, supernatural elements. And Riko Sakai um, actually has a good sense of humor. She apparently used to call up the director. The director was at English school to learn English before directing the American remake of The Grudge. And she would call him up and on the phone she would do the kind of that noise, you know, the kind of the, the, the creaky noise that is kind of the, one of the, the sound that kind of uh, tells you that the, the, the horror of the grudge is about to return, she would actually like call him up and make that noise down the phone to try to scare him. So obviously, even though she comes across as quite uh, vanilla flavor, she's got some spice to her, which is nice. And here, I mean, I'm sure everybody gets this from the, the subtitles, but she's finding out that even though she lost the baby in the car, she's now still pregnant. So the idea is that this evil presence has kind of replaced her innocent baby with um, a, you know, some, a substitute, which is, a, I think, a recurrent theme throughout movies. Pretty film, American films of David Cronenberg, the idea of being impregnated with some alien. And, of course, in the alien films as well, it's kind of a, a key motif, the idea that somebody could be impregnated. And then on the uh, ultrasound, you get these odd images that show this child is not the child who might be the expected progeny of, uh, of this character, of Kyoku Horasi. And back again to these photographs. And it is quite, uh, even in, in Chinese houses, in, in, when I'm in Hong Kong, sometimes you go to somebody's house and you see these photographs peering down at you, and it can be quite um, 
disturbing in a way. And there's a whole industry here for photographs of people taking photographs of um, these um, uh, black and white photographs of elderly people who may well pass away in the near future. So these can be used on gravestones and, and in houses. This is like a typical Japanese suburban house. And, of course, people who are um, growing up in Hong Kong, would uh, sorry, growing up in Tokyo, would see that uh, this is the very... Um, natural environment for them so they feel very much at home and then the horror is kind of creeping into the everyday environment for us as westerners i think we look at the film and we say okay well we're already inside this alien uh, society which is japan and then on top of that we have the horror so there's kind of a different experience from uh from this uh from the experience that a japanese audience have which is that they look at the uh they look at a film like this and they just go, okay, this is happening down the street. We have like the kind of the exotic nature of the fact this is Japanese horror. And then beyond that, we have the, uh, the genuine brilliance of uh, this particular kind of creature that's been created, a very ordinary horror that's been created by Takashi Shimizu. It's not a, uh, an alien. It's not any kind of extraordinary creature. It's like the black cat and the little kid and the, the, with the woman with the long hair and that particular noise, all the elements he uses to bring together. Big, big industry in Asia and certainly for wedding magazines and wedding boutiques. On the DVD commentary for The Grudge American Remake, Sam Raimi expresses his three rules of horror, which are rule number one, the innocent must suffer, the guilty must be punished, and the dead shall rise. So basically just another night out with uh, Mike Leader, just a date with Big Mike. The innocent will suffer, the guilty must be punished, and the dead will rise. And basically, you get two out of three in the grudge movies because the innocent suffer and the dead rise. But there's, I guess there's very little instinct of the, of the guilty being punished. It's really a kind of a, an all-purpose curse. Once you've been in that house, you're doomed. And, and basically that's it. So um, here we have this kind of rather disturbing time-lapse delay that this woman's been fallen asleep, wakes up at night time. And she's, again, this really speaks to the idea of ab abandonment, that she's been left alone. In, she's in her mother's house, but... Time has shifted in some way. Now she's alone. And, of course, the next scene will reinforce her aloneness. And obviously she expected that supper would have been prepared, that there would have been some evidence that, you know, they were going to have an evening meal. There's nothing. So this kind of sets up what we see next. It's always, I think, probably a mistake to read too much social comment into horror movies. But I think that horror cinema, the history of horror cinema, actually has reflected quite um, accurately the obsessions of its time. I mean, all those horror movies, the giant mutant spiders and stuff back in the 50s because everybody was scared of, atomic, scared of atomic weapons and something like Invasion of the Body Snatchers was the paranoia about uh, the so-called Red Menace. And now in this film, these films, I think we have this idea of uh, Japanese society, people in Japanese society becoming increasingly distant from one another. And this is being shown in kind of quite extreme ways. So this table, actually, it's a heated table with space underneath it where you could put your feet so you keep your feet warm while you were sitting having dinner. It's quite unique to Japanese houses. And then um, the mother sitting here, mother lying here, and uh, this is kind of something that you, an older person would do. They would keep their feet under the table to keep themselves warm at night, and obviously it's a, the house is very cold. Again, this is something I think that we find in genuine cases or alleged genuine cases of a ghostly uh, presence is that the place is, is very cold. So this is actually, there's a deleted scene here. You saw the reflection of Toshio there, and that's actually the only time we see him in the scene. We see him reflected in the mirror. And now um, we have um, Noriko Saikai goes back over to her mother. Kyoko goes back to her mother and tries to, during that moment, the mother's died. And so in the... Uh, full version, she, we get more reaction from, uh, from Kyoko. And the camera then pans back to, uh, after this, she's cradling her mother. The camera pans back over to the window, and we see the reflection of Toshio kind of leaning over them. And there's a lot of mist in the background, the smoke. And Shimizu cut that because it looked like smoke from like a non-existent fire. So he felt that it was raising a question in the audience's mind, is the house on fire? So he cut the scene. And on the, I'm presuming elsewhere on this DVD, we'll have deleted scenes. But anyway, I'll just describe the deleted scenes as we go along. But actually deleted, this is actually a slightly longer, the scene ran slightly longer. One thing I noticed in these movies is no one ever really seems to call the hospital. They end up there, but no one actually calls the hospital and says, my mother's unconscious, please bring her an ambulance. So this was like, leads into uh, the cut shot of Toshio. That poor kid, I mean, he must be uh, 
twisted. He must be warped for life by playing this particular role in these movies. Not to mention he must scare the pajamas out of his uh, school friends. So then, uh, as before, we always have these uh, names coming up of the different characters who are going to be in each of the episodes. This is Tomoka, uh, Tomoka Miura, played by the actress Chiharu Niyama. And she was born 14th of January 1981 in Aomori City, Japan. She's famous for a, um, a, uh, a commercial for Pokari Sweat, which is like an energy drink. I used to drink it a lot, and I realized there was a lot of sugar and a lot of salt in it, so I, I stopped. But anyway, Pokari Sweat. And in fact, I remember, I think um, that was a, a, an ad with a bunch of ostriches. She was actually wrestling ostriches in, in the outback in Australia. I think they have ostr ostriches in Australia. I should know because my family's from there. But uh, we don't come from where the uh, ostriches come from. So other projects she's been involved with, she worked on The Ring, the final chapter TV series. And Ring, the Ring series is kind of the sister series of uh, Jew on the Grudge. These two famous uh, ongoing um, uh, kind of series of film, horror movies made by Japanese filmmakers. And she's also in Godzilla, Mothra and King Ghidorah. Giant Monsters All Out Attack, which you may remember, I was meant to be doing the commentary for Jew on the Grudge number one with Mike Leader, and that's actually where he was. He was at the Giant Monsters All Out Attack, and he's also not uh, with us today, so I guess the attack continues. This is a very interesting um, segment. This the, the pre, I would say, a pre haunting, in that it's um, we're kind of seeing, hearing events that have not yet happened. And this is the girl, also somebody who's features in one of the segments. This is Meg on the left is Megumi, Megumi Obayashi, played by the actress Megumi Yamamoto. So her character name and her actor name are the same. But we'll talk a bit about the pre-haunting in a moment because it's kind of an interesting phenomenon and one that's actually been reported in terms of real ghost stories. I'm not a great believer in ghosts, but I'm always interested when I hear people's ghost stories. And uh, I did hear once the story of a pre-haunting. So again, you know, the idea of blending fact and fantasy or kind of like reality and reality TV as we have um, Tomoka as actually a presenter for a TV series and they're going on location to the house where evil dwells. Here's our director. Uh, the, actor the character name is Kisuki Oguni and the actor is Shingo Katsuriyama. And he was born on the 7th of April, 1972. Uh, and his movies also include Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah, uh, the Giant Monsters All Out Attack, a.k.a. Giant Monsters General Offensive, which um, obviously must have been a very busy, busy uh, event because it involved both Chiharu Niyama and uh, Shingo Katsuriyama. He's also in a movie, uh, TV series called Itsumo Futari D, uh, where he played a character called Naoki Okuta. And... This is probably his most high-profile performance in Juan the Grudge 2. He looks a bit like uh, Ikin Cheng, who's actually a, a Hong Kong actor that I've worked with. But um, good-looking guy, and again, looks like an actor, which is something that wasn't necessarily the case with the guys that we saw in The Grudge uh, number 1. So this is, again, another very ordinary uh, environment here in, here in, in Tokyo. So you, you don't feel that you're in anywhere in where, where there's any particular alert to the fact this is going to be somewhere with horror, uh, horror around every corner. So the pre-haunting. The idea here is that these characters, actually we haven't seen the house yet, which is kind of an interesting device. We've not seen the evil house. We see that figure hanging in the, in the corner there as like a pre-visualization of something that's about to happen. But all these people have been to that particular house, the house seen in the first film, and so they've carried with them this horror. And so um, we're kind of seeing these events without seeing the event that's actually caused them. We've seen the effect, and we've not yet seen the cause. And uh, this is something else interesting, the idea of people being displaced in time, um, something that you saw in the first film where there's a sequence, and it's repeated in the American remake when somebody buzzes the buzzer downstairs and the girl goes to open the door, and the guy that she thinks is, is there, or should be there, is not. This is uh, the actor K. Hori playing the character Noritaka Yamashita. So the actor name is Kei Hori, and he's Noritaka Yamashita. He actually was a schoolmate of the director, and uh, reminiscences about their times together when uh, on, on the DVD, on the Japanese DVD. And he's actually quite a talented person in his own right, uh, not just a uh, an actor, but also a writer, director, and producer. He wrote, produced, and directed his own film, which is called Glowing Glowing in 2001. Um, he worked on a video movie, Hi uh, Hiyakuju Sentai Gaurenjai vs. Super Sentai, which uh, was released in 2001. He's also on the TV series uh, Power Beast Task Force, 
and in 2003 played police chief Nishiyama in the Suicide Manual, Jisatsu Manuaru. And on the TV series I Know Soleya, which is a 2004 TV series, he played a character called Koichi Ozaki. But very gifted uh, actor and also somebody keen on pursuing a directing career, which is how he came to know Takashi Shimizu and I guess why he came to be cast in this particular role in the film because of their, their long friendship. So you get this uh, idea now of somebody actually the hearing the sounds of... Um, the, and eventually these two characters will be, will be hung. I have to believe you've already seen the film, but if you listen to my commentary, so you know that they both end up hanging. And the sounds they hear of banging against the wall is actually their hung feet banging against the wall. And I remember actually talking to somebody who'd actually had a pre-haunting experience in England. And there was a house where a young man had been... Uh, was going to be afflicted with pneumonia and die. And they actually heard the sound of this guy shuffling down the, the corridor and collapsing. And that sound was heard, like, months before he actually came to live there and then one time actually shuffled down the corridor and, and fell over and died. And so the sound of this was heard. So it was like a pre-haunting. It was, I mean, make of it what you will in terms of metaphysics, but it was actually that, the again, the, um, the effect was, was heard before the thing that had caused it. So here we have this scenario where they're actually going to go to look at the house uh, where we've seen all these horrific things happening. The house is actually established as being in Narima Ward in Tokyo. And Narima is the northwesternmost of the 23 special wards that comprise the urban center of Tokyo. So wards are like districts. Um, Tokyo, of course, is the capital of Japan. Here we hear the noise. That noise, instead of the creaky noise, is actually made by Takashi Shimizu himself. He goes into the studio and records it in person. And it's become, it was used in all the movies and also on the uh, American remake. So the ward itself, Narima Ward, where this house is set, was founded on August the 1st, 1947. And uh, Narima is famous for uh, producing Narima daikon radishes. And another claim to fame for that particular area is it's the setting for the very popular anime manga series Ranma Half, which was very, was, first came out in the 1990s, but that was all set in Narima. So we get kind of an echo of that here, and that's where the evil house is set. But as I mentioned before, yeah, we've got this whole scenario of a um, kind of a, a preview of horror, this kind of like advanced haunting. And this is actually a studio set that they're coming into. The reason for that was that later when they both get killed because of the mechanics involved, in physically lifting up the two people and having the hair, the, the, the ceiling covered in hair, you had to be in a studio set so you can control the environment. So the exterior is a housing block in Tokyo and the interior is elsewhere. But I love the use of time. In a way, I think in some ways this is actually the best realized of, these, um, of the segments of the film because of the flawless way in which uh, Takashi Shimizu moves back and forward between people's perspective. And he, sh he really gives you the idea that in some way time has become shattered for these people, and that they go, you can imagine yourself going through this experience when ordinary things are kind of twisted on their side. And here, he's actually seen the girl who's meant to be talking to him on the phone and then goes back and it's suddenly dark. And I think the reaction is perfect. And it's genuinely eerie because it's absolutely twisting all the things that we take for granted. And uh, the idea that time happens in a sequential manner, that things that begin now will end in five minutes' time. And here we have basically things... Uh, ending that have not yet begun. So it's truly unsettling and uh, a very uh, an evidence of any further evidence being needed of the horror genius of Takashi Shimizu. And this is actually a grip lowering down the hair uh, from, the, from the ceiling of the soundstage. So we have this reaction shot here. And then, of course, we're out of sequence. The film's like non-linear. So there's a whole sequence that's happened with the investigation of the horror house, and we go to see that later. So we... The characters basically killed and then resurrected according to the whim of the director. It really is like playing God, isn't it, be a, be a movie director. So now we come back and see these uh, the shoes. That was a, a point earlier. The fact that the shoes weren't there indicated that he'd not come back. The fact that the shoes are here now indicate that he has come back. So where is he? The hanging is actually something that you saw in the first movie. There We saw um, scenes where the father is actually hung. And in the American remake, the father who kills the family, who sets the whole grudge in motion, there's a scene where Sarah Michelle Gellar is in the house and she sees the father and he's been hung. And um, Toshio is like rocking... The, the, he's hanging from the hair like the characters are here. He's hanging from this hair hung from the ceiling. The ceiling incidentally, that, that hair was actually blow-dried stuck on the ceiling, stapled to the ceiling. And you can see that 
being done on the uh, behind the scenes footage from the film. And the uh, but anyway, so the um, there was a scene that was cut down for the American version because it was perceived as being too horrific, which had the father hanging from the the the, the, the wife demon's hair. And Toshio, the son, is like rocking the body back and forward. So this is exactly is, is echoed here, but it was cut from the American print of the theatrical release of the Grudge movie because it was perceived as being too scary. This um, the voice is, is Shimizu himself, and it's kind of representing the death rattle of Kayako, who was the wife and mother who died. Um, the character Toshio is actually played by another actor, Ryot- Ryota Koyama, in the two video versions of the Grudge One and Grudge Two. I tell you, I'm going to dress up my kids as Toshio next Halloween. We're going to scare the crap out of everybody in the neighborhood. So here we have uh, this sequence here where quite a tricky technical exercise to get the people up on wires and convincingly have them appear to be hanging. So here we see what caused the sound and the clock and everything. So it's a wonderful little vignette in and of itself, this little short film, and it works really well. And then, of course, we have another character stepping up, which is Megumi. Megumi, uh, the character of the makeup girl, who is Megumi Obayashi, who's played by Megumi Yamamoto. And uh, a really uh, good actress, very pretty and very smart. And uh, I think there is a sense in this movie that they had a slightly bigger budget that they could afford uh, slightly, you know, much better actors perhaps than the first film. Though occasionally there's still an ed- a rough edge to the performances, and I think that's something that um, Takashi Shimizu was, was going for. Uh, here's the director again, uh, Kazuki Oguni, and uh, Shingo, played by Shingo Katsuriyama. And it's like a, uh, a another veteran of uh, Japanese TV and cinema. Now we're actually in the real house. And the same house, this house actually did exist. The original house was did exist in a, does exist, I presume, in a suburb of Tokyo. God knows why anybody would dare to live there. And the, same, the house was built absolutely uh, wall for wall and room for room for the, pretty much the same for the U.S. remake. And all the exteriors and interiors for the U.S. remake were built at Toho Studios on the same main street where films like Seven Samurai and Godzilla were shot. And even though it was a set, the U.S. actors had to take their shoes off when they, they came in. Roger Ebert uh, commented that the house itself is not particularly creepy from an architectural point of view. And he says, if it didn't have a crawl space under the eaves, the ghost would have to jump out from behind sofas. I think actually it works well because of its ordinariness. You can imagine moving into a house like this and uh, you wouldn't necessarily anticipate the kind of horror. This is into whose POV is this? Again, uh, one of the clever tricks of Takashi Shimizu is this kind of like non-existent POV. Somebody, some presence observing the place. And also kind of reminding everybody this is, I guess he's figuring everybody who's seen this movie probably has seen Jew on the Grudge 1. And therefore, that they they are being reminded that you're in this truly horrific environment. So um, he's kind of giving you like a guided tour, but it actually doesn't. You know, there's not any POV. The red color in this vignette signifies ghost presence, and so we uh, we see there's something that's lifted actually from Sixth Sense. Every time you see the ghost in Sixth Sense, there's like red color on the screen and this stain on the ground. And uh, this actually is a um, kind of an image that's kind of a almost a kind of metaphor for the film the idea of the grudge being a an emotional stain left on a place so we'll talk about that some more later this is actually we see more of the exterior setting of the house than we did in i think in the first film you notice there's never any neighbors there's never anybody on the street it's always very empty this exterior is utterly different from the exterior we saw for the house which is all on a stage which we see in the grudge american remake there was a completely different and much more bare and old-fashioned exterior to the house when you see sarah michelle geller approach this is much more like a typical japanese suburb we're seeing here with the presentation for television and um, again, it's very mundane, evil, and a very, very uh, smart idea to kind of play to the video origins of the film by actually showing a video, uh, of this video footage shot for television. And in the American version of the interior of the house, where they built the interior of the house for the American version, they actually had two upper stories. So you actually had a, a scale replica second floor so that people would actually go up and continue acting if they were actually in a scene but because there was a lot of technical stuff that had to be done on that floor there was an entire replica of it elsewhere on the same in the same studio so you actually had two exact duplicates of the same set which is something i don't know that they would do in an american movie but i think it goes very much to the 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 detail of japanese uh, filmmaking and in some shots you see of the house in its heyday you see the name of the owner uh tokonaga katsuya 
on a, like a, a name board outside the house, and it says like oh, Mr. Tokunaga's house. And there's something that you would see in Japan. You actually have the name of the people who were living there. In this case, of course, the house itself has become this repository for evil. And it was something that when they did the American remake, they kind of made the decision that, okay, every, every, anybody who comes to the house will become, if you walk by the house, if you look at the house, you're fine. As soon as you come inside, you're doomed. And uh, this is something that's followed through in this film. There are, I think probably if you actually break down the logic of the movies, there's, there's some inconsistencies. But then you are dealing with supernatural, so I think it's probably not uh, appropriate to look at the... Um, supernatural with the same laws of logic that we apply to the, the natural world. So it's probably believable that you'd have that kind of thing. This is interesting, like the, the idea of capturing ghosts on video and on film. There's a movie just came out called White Noise, which starred Michael Keaton, which very much speaks to that and uh, talks about the fact that the ghosts, uh, the spirits, actually use the kind of the white noise of um, recordings or blank TV sets with no channel on them to communicate with the living. I am, again, a bit of a skeptic, but I think it makes for great entertainment, and it kind of provides a rationale for a way in which these spirits can communicate. This is something we saw in the first film as well, was like the ghostly presence of Kayako seen on a video camera, and we see it here again where they're actually filming, and we're going to get um, material appearing on film that was not immediately apparent when they were shooting on location, and there are cases of that happening. Here we are in the back garden, and this happy picnic, Interesting to note the um, <clears throat> the actress and the makeup girl sitting a little bit apart from the other people. And I think that's something that you might see in a, on a Japanese set, that the actresses would perhaps not be as familiar with the crew as, um, as they might otherwise be. And you see a kind of a recreation of the same backyard in the American remake with Sarah Michelle Gellar hanging out laundry. <laughs> and she admitted uh, that she was not overly familiar with uh, hanging out laundry because she grew up in New York and they didn't hang their wash out to dry. And we see here on the phone, there's like this lucky charm, which is basically to wish uh, a pregnant woman a, uh, a birth, uh, like a, an easy birth, a, a kind of like a, a, an easy labor. So the girl has this, Megumi has that on the phone. Megumi we, is perceived this as being slightly psychic, which is, I think, why the red color of ghosts is associated with her. So she can see things other people can't. So she knows that um, Kyoko is pregnant. So she's got this charm for her, which will allow for a, a good birth. And all, in, in Japan, I mean, there's a great belief in spirits in the, the Shinto tradition, which is like basically the appeasement of the spirits of the land, the air, the, the, the wind, the land, the air, the water. So you constantly have these charms to invoke their protection and their, their, their assistance. And this is actually one of them. In this instance, I think that prayer is probably, <laughs> probably not going to be answered. Pretty good-looking guy for a, a director. I mean, not saying there aren't some handsome directors out there, but uh, he looks more like an actor than most of the people that you see in these films. Very, um, the, the layout of the house, actually there's a website with every um, aspect of this, these films examined. They actually have like a layout of the house showing the slight differences between the different films. Again, interesting here to see the pre presentation of material to the audience that does not in any way relate to anybody's POV in the film. And that might sound obvious that you're going to show stuff that nobody in the film is looking at. But normally when you see any supernatural occurrence, the tendency is to have it from the POV of somebody in the movie or somebody observing it who's in the film and having their reaction to it. But here we see the happier time behind of Kayako there. That's the ghost in her happy days as being a mother. And there's Toshio in his happy days of being her son father was a graphic designer, so the son likes to do drawings as well. So we see him bringing a drawing into the room. No one's seeing this. The audience are the only ones seeing the ghosts do this. And again, you see in a moment, she knocks over the cup, and the ghost actually responds to that, but the cup has got red on it, and that obviously is like a ghost color. So when we see red, we know that uh, in this particular uh, segment, we know it means ghosts. So again, no one's seeing this, no one's reacting to the fact there's a ghost standing behind it, except the audience. But then there's a we, we now go over to Megumi, and because she is psychic, she's wearing the red jacket, she feels that there is something strange. And so we have that. Uh, the red jacket is kind of a, a hint. You see the only red elements in the frame, her jacket and the red cup. So uh, this is kind of like an interesting choice made by the director. Now we see the stain on the floor here. 
And uh, it's interesting to look at the stain. There's a wonderful scene in the American version. I think it was a reshoot scene to explain more readily what the grudge actually is, where the Japanese detective says that the grudge is actually evil, like a stain upon that place. So in this movie, we actually get to see the stain as kind of, it's like a Rorschach test. I mean, I guess you look at it and you see whatever you want to see, this peculiar, rather menacing stain on the floor of the house. This is a, uh, a lot of some cut material here. Actually, originally there's like a, the um, sound man, Soma, and the cameraman, Watanabe, are talking, and we see them discussing the, the day, and the car goes past carrying Kyoko and Masashi, and they talk about Masashi, how much they envy him. And then we go back over to the phone conversation, and then back over here, and there's little bits of moments there where the men are talking, and that was going to cut out, I guess, because it interrupted the flow of the scene. Now we have Megumi, she forgets her pouch and makeup, and she runs back up to the house. And uh, once she's uh, once she's in, Kazuki sees uh, Kayako's journal, which is actually is a uh, was a prop in the American movie. We see that in a moment. Then Megumi comes in to get her bag, and in the longer version, she notices the stain. It's now really liquid, and she moves to look at it and leans down, and then jumps back slightly. Her lipstick falls out of the pouch into the puddle, and it, she tries to pick it up, but her hand goes down like it's deep water, and then the lipstick sinks. And the reason the scene was cut is because at the end, Shimizu said that the puddle didn't look enough like the original stain. So he didn't think it was convincing. So he, they, they took all night to do the scene, and uh, Shimizu said that the crew had worked well, but they didn't use the scene in the finished film. So that was deleted. So here we have um, the photograph of... This is another recurring image through the film, this kind of these... Through the films, these photographs of the people who previously had lived here happily. And here, the scene where Kusuke, the director Kusuke, finds Kayako's journal. Kayako's journal, a very different version of Kayako's journal is a plot point in the American film where um, she has all this material about Bill Pullman's character, how she's obsessed with Bill Pullman. But uh, this is a different version of the same journal. A nice lighting of this particular shot. I mean, there's not a lot of showy camera work in these films, but that's actually good. And that's the name Kayako on the side. But those characters are actually characters that are not very familiar in Japan. There's not a very familiar name, and those characters are not very familiar. So there we have the Rorschach test again, and... Uh, what remains of the longer sequence when you actually saw the true nature of this stain, that it was, a, as they say, a stain upon that place. And the name on the letter there is Tokunaga Katsuya, which is the same name we saw outside of the house in other uh, shots we see of the house in the first film. Um, the, I'm indebted, by the way, to my friend Aya, a uh, lovely Japanese air hostess who came in and helped me look at some of the materials re relevant to The Grudge 2 and helped translate them into English. Um, thank you, Aya, for your help with that. So now when we... Um, we this it kind of has a final destination aspect to it. Everybody who's come into the house, everybody who's come in on this TV crew is going to die uh, or disappear presumably be killed. No, we don't see everybody die uh, off camera. Oh, sorry, on camera. I mean, people like the sound guy, the cameraman, everybody that we're seeing here actually get to... Uh, uh, later in the film, there's a reference to the fact they've disappeared. So I guess there are other stories untold where we see them um, getting their unjust desserts because they dared to go and film in the house. This horror has kind of followed them home. But we don't see that. We just get the idea that by being there, by actually being in the place, the stain comes onto you and will follow you wherever you go. So then this is a um, the sequence that we're seeing here. Again, we get actually extended material later shot in the, in the same environment of the, the TV studio. But uh, also this, the idea, as I mentioned before, that um, footage is actually, that the film TV footage has actually captured images of the ghosts who are haunting in that particular, particular place. An idea in these films that uh, has been put forward that they represent fem very feminine rage, even though the, there's a child involved, that the main angry demon is actually Kayako, who is the mother who was you know, killed and f doesn't know why and so cannot escape from the place. Her spirit is trapped in this place. And she's kind of perpetuating her rage again and again and again. Uh, in the American version, there's more of a rationale of why the husband was driven, to, was driven crazy. It was basically because of jealousy because she's kept this book about how much she loves this American teacher, the character played by Bill Pullman. But, I mean, of course, that doesn't justify any kind of violent action. But there's like a rationale that this woman actually did create a circumstance within which the, the jealous husband killed her. In these films, it's more a case that uh, the, there's something in the psyche of the husband that snapped, and so he twisted and broke her neck, so we get that odd sound, the, the kind of the cracking sound, which is like the death gasp 
of uh, the wife dying. And that sound has become, is one of the sounds that's kind of like uh, a key element of the manifestation of Juan, of the grudge. Again, the audience seeing information that nobody in the film is seeing. So it's like a kind of what they call it, look, a hint ye, look out behind you. The audience is seeing stuff that this guy isn't. He's like dozing off, and I guess the natural reaction, wake up, take a look, and uh, <clears throat> you'll know the horror that awaits you. Toshio then, um, Sarah Michelle Geller was saying that he was had a tough time on the set because he'd be working all hours. There were no child labor laws in Japan. So he'd be you know, at 3 a.m. on the cold set in his little underwear doing doing these kind of scenes and that it was no, not much fun for him. And he, she said he's kind of an odd little kid. I mean, the experience seems to have changed him. He doesn't react to stuff like ordinary children do. So, I mean, I think uh, probably there's a sense they might, if they think about doing a third film, they might recast and put a younger kid in there rather than keep using this poor boy again and again for these for these long hours. The idea of the hair as uh, an instrument of death is kind of something that speaks also to the Chinese legend Bride with White Hair that became a movie, a couple of movies, and uh, is actually also being developed as an American remake at the moment. But the idea of this woman's hair being used as an instrument of, of killing people. And the hair also, the hair across the face, uh, this kind of um, female spirit with, with, with the hair coming down and her eyes looking through the hair. That's also an image of The Ring. I mentioned before, The Ring is like that kind of parallel popular film series, horror film series being produced in Japan. And the, that image, the image of the eye looking through the hair is so strong, it was actually the, the main uh, poster artwork for the US version of The Grudge, rather than an image of Sarah Michelle Gellar, which you might have expected. And here is the stain, this uniquely shaped stain that had actually come to... Um, has followed her home, followed her from that house to the studio. And this is uh, speaking back. Obviously, this had to do, would have a different resonance if we'd seen the full version before where her hand actually disappears down into this, what is like a pool, a pool of evil. This could so easily be hokey. I mean, it works within the, uh, within the context of the scene. It could be Cousin It gone bad or one of the tribbles from Star Trek, this idea of this animated wig and I think what makes it work is this is Megumi's performance the fact that she's genuinely terrified by this manifestation and it's been looking at inanimate objects moving I actually had an experience when I was young of a bottle of Tipex of like kind of uh, liquid paper moving across the table by no apparent means that's my one encounter with the supernatural and I mean there's nothing as unthreatening as a bottle of um, correctional fluid but it was pretty scary because there was no explanation for why it moved so here we have this whole scenario constantly being recreated, the scene in which the wife has been killed and Megumi here experiencing firsthand what the wife had, had gone through and now this manifestation of rage of, of Kayako who's um, decided that uh, you know, her spirit can never rest. And so she, she, incidentally, there's no special effects work involved with her coming out, her movement there. That's all pure, like a, a mime act that she and the director work out before each take between themselves. And so she actually performs that. So that's the sad demise of Megumi. And then we, um, as I mentioned before, each segment of the film coming out as a uh, as kind of a vignette focusing on a different character. And this one um, coming out as, as uh, Kayako, who is the, the wife, the wife that died so many years before. And uh, actually, I think it's set like three three years prior to this these events that the family were actually killed. So there's the altar over by the, the the altar to the memory of the mother. So she's kind of joined the photographs of the people that we saw on the walls. She's died as well. And the um, there's a myth which is kind of one of the basic myths of Juan about an emperor who played chess with his servant, and when the servant won. He killed the, the servant and the, wife, and the servant's wife and the servant's child and the servant's cat. And the spirits of the child and the cat fused and became a demon. And that's actually, I think, one of the original myths behind this series, the idea that when Toshi died, he and the cat, Ma, became fused, which explains the, the way that the child behaves and the noises that he makes. And this is more in keeping, I think, with traditional ghost story, the idea of seeing the mother who's passed away and uh, the... This uh, Masashi, of course, uh, has been in a coma for the entire time. Something I was interested in, we never actually get to see inside his head. We just get him as a, uh, an object 
almost in the film. And I thought um, one take would have been to actually see what's going on in his mind of a comatose person, but we don't. He's just like an object who's used in this respect to, and, and this basically he's like saying to her, don't give birth because what she gives birth to will be a monster. So when she's dropped, she's dropped the uh, incantation, this kind of prayer for a, an easy delivery, and uh, when she reaches out to get him, the unconscious Masashi grabs her by the hand. An unusually idyllic shot of Tokyo. Notice the building's not that tall as they are in other cities in like New York and Hong Kong. The reason for that is because there are many earthquakes in, in Tokyo, in Japan, so buildings are not allowed to go up above a certain height. It's very unusual for us in these films to see a, a beautiful view like that of the cityscape. Normally it's within this very bland urban environment, suburban environment. And here's uh, Masashi, who's like kind of come back, but uh, he's like a, a shell of his former self after this experience. So you have this beautiful cityscape. And then you go to the rooftop of the hospital, which is particularly drab. And this is something that, you know, Takashi always, Takashi Shimizu is constantly kind of playing up in his film, the idea of the mundane nature of horror, that horror doesn't exist in some kind of greatly removed environment from where we are now. It's actually just one beat away from where we are. The, uh, the premiere of this movie in Japan, they pulled, all, pulled out all the stops to scare the audience. They actually hired a professional medium to come into the theater before the film to summon a spirit. So she was possessed and her whole routine of being possessed by a spirit. And after that, I guess to get rid of the spirit that they'd summoned up, they had a Shinto priest come in and perform a ceremony to protect them both from that specific ghost that had been brought by the medium and also by any monsters inherent to the material that you see in the film. So that was a um, kind of an, something I don't think we would necessarily see happening in, in America, given that people are very sensitive about anything relevant to black magic or the devil. The Grudge US version released in 2004 was such a big hit. It was actually uh, the sequel, the follow-on. The, the American version of this film, the kind of the American Grudge 2, was greenlit immediately after the film stormed to 39 million at the US box office. So big, big hit. I mean, horror always seems to have a very good chance in the American marketplace. And so um, did so well. So the sequel was actually already is in development. I don't know to what extent the American sequel will follow the events that we see here, though I would say it's an interesting idea to bring in an American actor, actress to, to investigate the house and then have the horror follow thereafter. So they may indeed follow on the events of this film quite closely. This film, Juan 2, was actually nominated for Best Film at the Spanish Sitges Film Festival. And uh, it's, uh, the films themselves have been critically acclaimed, as well as having this kind of really broad cult following. There's a cult following for the original Japanese movies, and there's actually, of course, now a whole new audience who've come into the films of The Grudge through watching the glossier American remake. And uh, now, actually, on DVD, they have The Grudge as made by uh, the, the, the American cut of The Grudge, and they soon have Takashi Shimizu's director's cut of the American version of The Grudge, which has got more detail in it. They had to cut stuff to get the rating they wanted for the American market. And quite often in these films, you get these unusual shots that seem to be um, somebody almost eavesdropping, somebody watching from a distance as two people talk. And so you get, again, a sense of isolation, both between the characters and also we have an, uh, we, we're isolated from them. Uh, and on top of that, you have the idea of some unseen presence who's observing them because you get like a, the, these kind of unexplained... POV shots. And that's something that Asian cinema has always been ahead of the curve because in the old days in America there used to be very strict studio restrictions on how you could use the camera. That you couldn't that the audiences mustn't be allowed to be allowed to be confused. So you'd get your notes back from the studio on rushes saying, you know, why is the camera moving in that way? You have to reshoot that because the audience won't understand. They'll think somebody's looking through that door. They'll think someone's running along on the ground looking up. They won't be able to understand what's happening. In Europe and in Asia, that was never an issue. And directors had such autonomy. They basically said, okay, I'm going to move the camera how I want. And so, in a sense, American filmmaking has been catching up with, in terms of camera movement, in terms of the way the camera could be moved, with work that was being done. You have people like Kurosawa pioneering movement of the camera in Japan, and of course filmmakers in Europe doing films. I mean, I'm not as great an expert on European cinema, but from what I've read, the idea that in Europe you could actually have a lot more freedom, and in America the studio system, one of the bad things about the studio system is that it kind of restricted the language of film. And what I think that, that, that Takashi Shimizu does with these movies is actually explore ways in which he can use filmmaking, even though we've seen these, this scenario, the haunted house, the unquiet spirit, this um, 
uh, vengeful uh, presence that's following these people. We've seen it in so many films, both in America and in Asia, again and again over the years. What makes it fresh is the fact that he's using the language of filmmaking in a different way, the A, Bs and Cs, he's actually mixing it a different way. I think that's what American audiences and what Sam Raimi, who produced the remake, found so interesting, was this the idea that you could take from, from material that was so familiar, that was so old hat, and make it fresh again based on your perspective. And for the record, I thought the American remake, they did a very good job in conveying the elements that made the, the first film work. And the one thing that really stood out and said, OK, this is you know an American version, is the fact they actually had a scene where a character says, this is what's going on. Because there's still a sense, I think, that American audiences may be confused by, uh, by this. This is a great shock. I mean, the fact that you turn around and you see somebody who is like, as I was going down the stair... I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. I wish, I wish he'd go away. I remember that nursery rhyme from when I was a kid, and it you know, absolutely scared the crap out of me. And this is kind of, again, defies some of the conventions of the genre in that you actually do get two people see the same experience, and you actually have the physical movement of an environment by a, a spiritual being. And there's something, because Megumi was psychic, that, that her resident spirit has different attributes than those of people, the other people who've been killed. So she actually gets to communicate slightly more in a different way because we've, we've actually established her in the beginning when she was first established as somebody who had a slight a, a psychic potential. So that meant that she could uh, see ghosts or she could communicate with the, with the dead. So this is, of course, back at uh, Kyoko's house, which, again, it was kind of an interesting thing. I mean, here's a woman who's a successful actress she had a boyfriend, she's pregnant by her boyfriend, but she's still living at home with her mom. And then after the mother's death, she's still living alone in the house where she lived with, with her mother. Whereas I think in the real world, there's a sense of like, wow, you know, if you were a successful actress, probably you'd buy a nice flat for mom and you'd move in with your boyfriend. And secondly, that when she passed away, you might not want to keep living in the same house that you would sell up and move out. But I guess that's also one of the you know, givens of the horror movie industry that people don't do the logical things that one would expect. And if they did, horror movies would end really quickly because people would say, hey, let's go in the old spooky house. Um, let's not. And that'd be it. The opening uh, line of the American movie is when someone dies in the grip of a powerful rage, a curse is born. And this is certainly uh, borne out here when we see this curse that's been brought out into the world by these people murdered in this house. I mean, there's a sense, I think if they went to do a third film, the one thing that's missing from these films is any redemptive force, is any force for good that opposes this evil. And so uh, we really um, are constantly um, faced with this oppressive evil with no counterbalance. There's no sense. It's like in The Exorcist when Max von Sydow is asked why this is happening, and he says, I think it's to make us give up hope. And that seems to be, uh, make us abandon hope. And that's certainly the sense in these films that one is meant to abandon hope. Here again is um, Kayako's diary, which is this key plot element here in this film. And it's almost like Megumi's come back from beyond to offer them a warning about what they're facing. But at the same time, she doesn't offer any salvation or any way out. And I think that that's, if they did another movie, what I'd love to see is a film from a Buddhist perspective where some uh, powerfully good person came in and in some way found a way to absolve Kayako and Toshi so they could actually go to rebirth and they actually let go of the evil. I mean, because it's a very Buddhist concept, the idea that uh, all suffering comes from attachment to emotion and uh, to attachment in general, but specifically here, their suffering is from attachment to this kind of extreme emotion and that it's by detaching yourself from that that you can actually find peace and eventually enlightenment. And I think that's something that would be interesting, but I don't know that that's where Takashi Shimizu is going in his work. I think probably a third installment would get yet more dark and bloody than the ones before. So you get like a, um, a sense here of this kind of unremitting force of evil against which poor humans have absolutely no uh, ability. It was in, in, in terms of its structure, it's really not that much far removed from... The old movies, the um, Friday the 13th, because you had this evil force against which humans were powerless. This scene is heavily cut down. Originally, they pick up the diary, they go in, and there's a longer version where um, Kazuke shows Kyoko all the film taken in the house, and we see her reaction to astonishment as we see Kako on screen, we see Toshi on screen. Then he brings out the blue diary 
and which we're looking at now with all the information about uh, the blue folder, sorry, with all the information about the murders. And they basically go through in quite a straightforward manner all the aspects of the, of the, of the murders, the fact that all this phenomena has been happening. Now we really get a much abbreviated version of that just with the basic information. There was actually um, a, uh, a reference to the fact that uh, there's a reference in the materials on the DVD, on the Japanese DVD, that Kyoko is not a very common name. So it was like unusual that Kyoko would be able to read it without any, any trouble. So the, this is actually much cut down from that scene because we didn't actually get to see Kyoko looking at all the monitors' video material. And um, there was a, a sequence, like a, a flashback, like a montage of sequence, that flashback to the car crash, of all the things that she's experienced since, of seeing Toshio under the steering wheel of the car in her home, in ultrasounds from the gynecologist, and she's looking more, more terrified. And it was like cut out from the film and the scene edited down because the director felt he'd already shown that that you'd already seen all those supernatural elements of the movie, and it was kind of really redundant to show it all again from her perspective. So it's kind of the thing that they probably would have kept in on an American version because you wanted to tell the audience very obviously in steps, this is what's happening. And Shimizu actually liked the scene in and of itself, but he wanted to cut it because um, to keep the tempo moving. And this is kind of like the diary and its contents are like familiar to fans of the of the of the movie of the movie series as like key points, uh, but the actual um, the, the depth of information that you see might have been confusing to people who are not familiar with the the video uh, the original video films. There was information there that was only really apparent in the in the video films because you saw um, that it talked about the fact that in that house the father had killed the mother, um, and then the cat, and then the kid, and then he had died. And there's, in, in, the, in the news story, it says he actually dies in the street, but in the subsequent versions of the film, we actually see him being hung. He's hung in the house. But maybe it's like a representation of him that's being hung after his actual demise. It may not be a genuine representation of the actor himself. That was a very um, brief shot of the, the father, uh, Takeo Saike, Who's um, he's like um, was a, the, the one of the key players, obviously in this tragedy. He's uh, played by the actor Takashi Matsuyama. Takashi Matsuyama is actually a voice artist. You can hear his work on Ghost in the Shell, Street Fighter Three, and even on the Japanese version of Powerpuff Girls. And we see his murder. He has a much bigger role to play in the American version of The Grudge. So we get to see his, uh, his death in, in, in greater detail. But the character named Takeo Saike, who was 34 at the time he died, a professional illustrator, and he met Kayako when he was 25 and she was 19. They married. A few years later, they gave birth, she gave birth to the son, Toshio. And um, Takeo's motivation for the murder is that he found the diary. And in the Japanese version, she's kind of writing about her obsession with a former college classmate, Shusuke Kobayashi. And, of course, in the American version, it's the Bill Pullman character who inspires this kind of jealous rage. So um, when um, Takeo believes that Kayako is having a relationship with Kobayashi, he goes berserk, kills his wife with a box cutter, um, and then goes on from there on this kind of killing spree. And here we see um, a realization of the, uh, the stain as like a doorway through to this world of chaos of this kind of of the, of the grudge world as we have Megumi coming back and this would have had a different in, if we'd seen the earlier scene where we saw the kind of that it's like a gateway um, it would have had a different resonance but here we're seeing it as a she's coming from the other direction and before she was putting stuff in and now she's coming out so we have again all this um, really for the benefit of the audience is being scared because uh, unless we can say this is Kyoko's dream and then the kind of the protective spirit of the mother wakening her there. So you have all these elements, and really, I think, rather than obeying a very linear logic, uh, the director really looking for what effect will have the, most, the best emotional, visceral reaction from the audience. So I think you could sit and analyse these films you know, to your heart's content. But basically, they're about the brilliance of this director in creating an atmosphere of unease and finding a shock where there's not a shock, um, you know, apparently, immediately apparent. So this kind of speaks back to the scene that we saw that was cut, where she's actually having a little flashback there to an event that happened before and kind of coming to realise that the fetus she's carrying within her is not perhaps what it appears to be. 
Um, and the director, Takashi Shim uh, Shimura, actually played, paid credit to um, the actor Takashi Matsuyama in talking about this movie. But he was actually, even though um, Takashi Matsuyama doesn't appear in the film other than in those photographs, uh, which we saw briefly in the blue folder, photographs reflecting the horrific events that had set everything in motion. And so now we are back at this this place. And I mean, you know, I always think in horror movies, we're lucky, I guess, if we enjoy horror movies, we're lucky that people are prepared to go into these environments uh, again and again. And uh, in, in the face of all uh, sane rationale, when you should actually, you know, run for your life, they actually do keep coming back to these environments where there's evidently some kind of horrific presence and they just keep coming back for more and I'd be out of town I'd be on the next uh, I'd get out of Dodge but uh, she comes back to this place and interesting looking at the uh, the fact that this house I mean the original house that's been now seen in its entirety as a real house and also as a studio set recreation the different aspects of it that have gone on from film to film and how this really mundane environment has become somewhere which has imposed itself on our psyche as film goers and as uh, people who are fans of horror movies this house is every bit as scary as like Dracula's mansion or whatever else you want to see and then we are going back to the uh, our movie extra who's now trapped within the same environment this is actually something we saw in uh, the um, in the uh, American remake of The Grudge the idea of somebody going into the house and seeing she, uh, the, the Sarah Michelle Gellar character or the Bill Pullman character and what, it, what happened with him this speaking now to the uh, the, no, the ghost character com coming down the stairs. Incidentally, when she's coming down, there's no special effects work to speak of. It's worked out between the actress and the director beforehand, and she comes down without pads or wires or, or anything. And so, um, tough, tough lady, tough performer, and very charming looking in real life. Not at all the horrific figure that we see in the films. If you see her as an actress, here's some interesting uh, Japan shots, kind of like these strange POV shots which again conveying this, this sense of unease and without any real uh, sense of like being a, a POV of any person as such it's just like a sense of this city and this particular place where there's something horrific uh, happening and very effective I think uh, you know that uh, you can do a lot with horror probably you know you can do a lot with a little and it becomes more disturbing the less that you actually see the more you imply that there's stuff around a corner or um, just beyond the edge of your experience, the more the more terrifying it becomes. Schoolgirls, we actually saw that this is kind of a, like a, uh, I don't want to go into it in too great a depth, but the schoolgirl uniform thing is quite a, a subcult itself in Japanese uh, pop culture. We actually saw that the um, schoolgirls who fell prey to the curse in the first film, and now we have um, a movie extra who also comes in and, you know, falls prey to the same curse in uh, in this film. And um, in the movie, in the American remake, there was actually a very brief nod to that when you saw Sarah Michelle Gellar and at the beginning of the film, her and Jason Burr walking in the street and you see some schoolgirls. So that's kind of a reference to this recurring theme. But this nightmarish thing where this poor movie extra finds herself trapped within real horror. She's actually an extra in a horror movie and then finds out, you know, the horror movie is a lot more real than she had anticipated it being. So Kayako, Kayako Saeki, Saeki, the character, which is the main horror of the film, her Kayako was at the, age, at the time of her death uh, 28 years old. Her maiden name actually is Kawamata. So she was um, uh, Kawamata Kayako. She took on the married name Saeki. And she's this kind of very quiet uh, young lady with no, no real friends. And uh, she stalked one of her classmates in college and kept a journal of that. It's like, so she's got a little edge to her character. And later gave up that relationship and uh, when, when, he, when this, uh, the man she was obsessed with proved to be in love with another woman. And so she met Takeo. They began a relationship, married, and she later gave birth to the son Toshio. And so that's like kind of our backstory leading into why we have this vengeful, uh, this venge that was the, the real woman behind the vengeful spirit that we see. And here we are on this very quiet uh, urban back street and Japanese girls in, I mean, you know, come on, are you going to do a horror movie in Japan and not have cute Japanese girls in schoolgirl outfits? 
And we actually see now, again, the uh, nonlinear storytelling as the girls. And the, the way she ducks down, that probably could be done slightly better, the way she ducked down under the camera when she got to a certain point. Um, I guess they wanted to have like a different effect to get out of the shot, but she's quite evidently there ducking down out of camera range. So we're playing back and forward with time and space. As I mentioned, um, so Kayako has um, uh, a son called Toshio, and he enters elementary school. Uh, he's six years. Toshio is six in elementary school, at which point Takeo, the husband, finds the journal. He's so jealous, becomes enraged, tortures Kayako, and finally kills her. And then her death gives rise to the grudge. And um, because he broke her spine, that's why she moves in this strange way and makes this strange noise. And when they were doing the American version of The Grudge, Sarah Michelle Gellar and everybody was saying, well, gee, we want to see how they achieved the visual effect of the girl coming down the stairs. And in fact, it was like a mime show. She basically acted out what she was going to do and then crept down the stairs. And you know, that's what we see. What you see basically on film is what you saw on the set with the addition of the sound effects. So this is actually going back to a sequence we saw. Now we know it's actually in a movie, but now we see, we're going to see what she actually saw. And uh, uh, being an extra in the film, she's um, meant to be scared, but not that scared. But what she's seeing, of course, is uh, our own favorite pet ghost, Toshio, who's very close to the womb of um, this woman. The reason being that this is going to be the rebirth of Kayako, Kayako coming back into the world so there's this strange connection between uh, Toshio, the ghost, and uh, the child that, that this woman's carrying within her. So you get this, her, the, the hand touching there. And that's a strange, strange image. It's kind of a reverse, the, almost like the child becoming father to the mother. And Kaiko is actually, we see in different presences in the films, in both this first film and uh, in the first film and in this movie, we see her in her normal self. We see this kind of black smudge on the screen, her white ghostly version, the white bloody ghost version, and all these, um, all these different uh, incarnations of this same realization of horror. And, uh, you know, it's really, it taps into these ancient mythologies, this kind of, something very different to the kind of horror movies you see in, in Hollywood, where when you think of horror movies, you really think of like, you know, these kind of big busty co-eds being chased through the woods by some madman with an axe. Here, horror's taken on a different form. And also, it's like, unusually, it's like a female horror. I mean, in, in, in American films, normally horror is very, the actual source of horror, the Freddies and Jasons, they're very male. And here's like the female, the female horror. So there's this, uh, again, this uh, wonderful playing with time and experience. The director is so good at doing that. And you can always, the great thing that he does is you sh he shows the, um, the kind of the confusion and fear of the character without ever confusing the audience, that you actually do follow beat by beat what they're experiencing. You don't understand why it's happening, but you're not confused about where we are when you follow it and experience the, the horror of this kind of separation from the normal. But um, the storytelling is done in a very, in a very uh, clear way, even though it's nonlinear storytelling, but it's told in a very clear way. So it, show, it reflects confusion without in itself being confusing. And again, that's a major accomplishment on the part of the director. I know this sounds like a, you know, a commentary love letter, but I'm really, the more I watch these movies, the more I feel Takashi Shimizu is a, a genius. And, and the fact that he could direct a film as good as The Grudge, the American remake, in a foreign language with American actors, I mean, speaks to the universal nature of his talent because it's really quite a challenge. Um, I mean, I, I, there's been instances in the past where American directors have gone to, the, to Asia, but I think a Japanese director... I mean, the thing is, in Asia, everybody speaks English as a second language. In the West, nobody speaks... Very few people speak Japanese as a second language. So I think it spoke to his... Uh, the fact that he could transfer his talent over to work within the demands of the Hollywood system. And the cut they got of the grudge, of course, was much um, diminished from what he would like to have done. But at the same time, it reflects enough of his original vision that the film performed very well and showed that you could take a great concept like The Grudge and bring it over into any market and it would work. That was actually briefly their POV. And then a rare opportunity to see Toshio as his normal un-ghost like self. And then that shot there, the, the rolling head, that struck me as going like a kind of a head too far. Um, that was probably you know out of sync with the rest of the that what we've seen in the films. And there's the kid again. And uh, 
Sarah Michelle Geller was talking about him. He's an interesting guy. Uh, the only thing about him is he's terrified. Yui is terrified. Yui Ozeki is terrified of cats. So every time they have the scene with him and the black cat, he absolutely doesn't like it and uh, will be kind of really nervous and, and bad tempered because he absolutely doesn't like uh, doesn't like the cat. And he's a, according to Sarah Michelle Geller, kind of an, an odd child. And she'll be trying to ask him through his his translator or his mom what what the kids at school said about him and everything like that. And he found it difficult. I think the kid found it difficult because he didn't speak English when they were doing the American version of The Grudge. And he felt, as a child anyway, removed from the adults and working all these long hours. And uh, I think he's um, probably had a harder time on it than any of the other performers. Another genuinely terrifying image there of Kayako. I think one of the great creations of the modern era of horror, I mean, Kayako is one of the great the great horror images, her and Toshio as a, as a double team. They're about as scary as anything that's been created in the last 10 years of horror. And uh, there was an interview when Sarah Michelle Gellar was being asked, you know, was this kid familiar with Scooby-Doo and did he think that Daphne was going to come and rescue him? And she replied, I don't know what that kid was familiar with. So anyway, I hope Toshio, uh, the, the Yuya, Yuya Ozeki, is not actually scarred for life. They always had these conversations actually back in the days of The Exorcist about whether <clears throat> the uh, Linda Blair would have been, you know, in any way damaged psychologically by playing this character of this possessed woman. And um, I guess she wasn't because she had a very decent career thereafter and uh, grew up to become quite a normal person. So hopefully the same is true of you, your Ozeki. But certainly a very striking, memorable character. Like I said, I've got um, two twin boys who are of the right age, so I'm going to dress them up as... Uh, two little Toshios at Halloween next year, and we're just going to have fun in the neighborhood. I presume these films will still be in circulation at that time, so that it should scare everybody, including the neighbors. be a lot of fun. Um, again, you know, this whole thing of, like, the people coming back repeatedly to this evil environment, and, I, and I, you've got to wonder, you know, why um, characters in horror movies, without any plan, I mean... I think if he'd uh, obviously come to rescue um, the girl, but if, if he'd actually gone to a uh, exorcist or gone to somebody who's like a Buddhist master and said, hey, you know what, I want to go in there and fight evil and had been given um, the right, um, some technique with, with which to do that, it would make sense, him constantly coming, coming back into the house again. But as it is, they keep coming back. The only guy, I think, who really had the right idea in the... In the um, American version, it's particularly a strong scene when the detective shows up with the gasoline to burn the place down. And I think all the audience were cheering and they're basically like, yeah, go for it, burn it, baby, burn it, because they, they figured that was probably the only way to deal with, with the evil. It's some interesting behind-the-scenes footage of this sequence being shot. And, it, again, it's very disturbing because I think the process of childbirth is so emotional anyway and such a enormous physical... Uh, exerts such enormous physical stress on the part of the of the mother that to add to that this kind of horrific supernatural element and it, what a brilliant thing to cut away at that particular moment just when it reaches uh, fever pitch and Masashi had obviously come back from his coma but is not himself and is reacting and is is connected in some way to this evil spirit that's going to be reborn into the world in a sense what we're seeing here with the rebirth does set up a whole new level of evil for a, any Japanese version of, of Juon, like a Juon 3, of a, an, another, a third film in the series. They're already preparing, as I mentioned earlier, the sequel to the American version, but I'm pretty sure that given the success of these two incarnations, you're going to see Juon the Grudge Part 3. So here we have like this, uh, uh, the effect, th th this is a recurring idea that supernatural powers can actually affect the physical environment with the electricity being cut on and off and the reaction of the horrified delivery staff and he's chanting mother, mother at the end of the bed because he's welcoming his mother like back into the world so we get like this the brilliance of this is you actually don't get to see what's being born so it's kind of like uh, the Rosemary's ba Baby thing. You actually don't see the realization of the child until the very last moment. But the audience has, has been tipped off by the fact that Toshi is saying, Mother, Mother, we're going to see some kind of incar incarnation of um, Kayako coming back into the world. And this really does have about it the quality of nightmare as uh, he's coming in. And uh, so this is actually uh, on location. This isn't a studio set. This is actually all built on location. 
And so they've got like a, um, um, not a hospital, but they actually got a location where they set it up with these support players who've been wiped out by the by the evil, by this evil presence. And uh, of course now the, the audience, it's kind of like the alien in that you kind of got this thing of like something has been impregnated an alien artifact has been impregnated into this woman and it's now manifested and like what does it look like and is it going to jump out at him and what form will it take and this is like uh, building up the suspense for this final reel and obviously you feel a sense that they need to find some way to top the horror that we've seen before so here we have this again this amazing physical performance of uh, the Kayako character coming out now stained with blood from this horrific rebirth and again, no special effects, just this physical. And if you see this actual actress in her real self, she's so charming and sweet and, and cute and, and utterly not like the way she's now known worldwide as this horrific manifestation. And that sound, the sound of the neck being broken. and her, her She's been tortured. I mean, she was tortured for a long time before she died, which explains the blood. I mean, obviously, a, a neck break would be quite a clean death. But she was actually... Murder, uh, tortured before murder so you get all the blood and, and, and everything on her of this spirit that's actually keeping all of that pain and resentment and hurt alive and as I say really really a to me a satisfying third installment would include in it the redemption of these characters where they could actually wash the stain on this place clean and move on to some better rebirth but I wouldn't put money on it I think that the evil is going to get a lot more dark before it ever lightens so this is our, as always is the case with these horror movies, you always kind of pretty much get rid of the supposed leading man and leave the poor lady to face the, the dark alone. So our, our, you know, I guess our leading man equivalent has been wiped out by Kayako. And so we have Kyoko now waking up, having given birth and experiencing, you know, a particular form of... Um, of postnatal depression. I don't think we, we've never seen postnatal depression in, expressed in quite this way before. And I, as I mentioned earlier, there is a genuine concern when you make these films, because people in Japan are quite uh, superstitious, they will have Shinto priests come in. And we actually have a bai-san ceremony anyway at the beginning of films to hope for good fortune in the filmmaking process. But I think uh, that they have particular purification ceremonies that are done on these films in Japan because they're worried about any long-term lasting effect that there might be something happening in real life similar to um, what's being shown in the movie. I think this is a very good choice uh, that we don't actually see what this particular creature is. We don't actually see what's in there. And uh, it's great acting by, uh, by in this moment. I mean, it's just this kind of like, it's after all of the storm and fury, this quiet moment, there's something really, really disturbing about it. You know, the idea of this mother love coming out over everything, <clears throat> over sanity, over self-preservation. And now this disturbing coda for the film. And this kid running along here is uh, Naroki Matsuyama, some kid from a local acting school in Tokyo where they, were car they went to find children to play uh, these particular roles. And the little Kayako, who we see walking along with her mom, is played by a, a young actress called Yu Kamada. So we have another actress playing uh, Kayako in this film. And this, uh, she's carrying the diary, which is kind of a bit of a giveaway as to what, who the character really is. And the hair looks very familiar as well. So this uh, boy noticing something a little off about the, this too. And the football, which of course we had a little reference to football earlier, which, which became the head of Toshi. And uh, again, the kind of the finding the unease in the ordinary. This is like the most ordinary setting, the most ordinary looking couple, and yet there's something not quite right, and it's only the boy who's taken that everybody else would not notice, but this boy taking this moment to look. A lot of the times with these films, I mean, there's images and uh, moments that uh, don't necessarily make sense, and this, this, but they work on a kinetic, visceral level. So here you have that reference. That's actually the final shot of the American version as well, the, the head turning around with the eye looking through. And so reference the fact that we are looking at the young Kayako, who is now, she's dispensed with the mother because, uh, and the mother also being coming down the stairs, which is a reference to Kayako's own demise, where she's like, her neck is broken and she's being dragged down the stairs by, by the father, or she's falling down the stairs. 
So you have this moment here, really oddly poignant moment, and it really stays with you after you've seen the film. And if you've seen the film in the theater, you walk out kind of remembering this strange image of this woman, you know, Kyoko's in a strange way kind of at peace. She's given birth to this horror, and now she can go. But then this, this shot, the, the, the eye looking through the hair, such a strong image. It's just simple, but such a strong image. So it turns up again and again in the marketing for this film. Actually, the, the artwork for this film, the first movie, the primary artwork was Toshio's image. On the second one, it's Kayako. So it's much more Kayako's film. And this like, gesture, final gesture, loving gesture here of the mother. Very strange, very uh, moving. And the music coming in. The music in the films, you don't get much harmony. It's normally discord because it's reflecting the, the horrific events. And usually now we get ordinary people in the background. These films hardly ever have ordinary passers-by or bystanders in any way involved. We, saw, we see them at the beginning of the Grudge American movie when Bill Pullman jumps off the balcony. We see actual people coming in to stare and they're so surprised, you know, my God, what's happened? And, and we see that here at the end. Um, but it's unusual in these films. And that figure standing there in the middle ground there, oh, I don't know who that is. There's a guy just standing there. And it, we just see behind him the figure of the newly reborn Kayako walking alone through the streets and looking scary as all hell. And then we go into the final theme song of the movie. It's performed by a girl band called Suete Shoju, Sweetie Shoju. And the theme song is called Machigai, which means wrong. Machigai, wrong, performed by Suete Shoju. And this is a very sweet ballad, and it really kind of is a counterpoint with all the horrific stuff we've seen before. So there we have it, Juon the Grudge number two, a different uh, kind of horror. I mean, I think very smart that the director, uh, Takashi Shimura, played off the fact that his audience will have seen the first film, that he had to make a different film from the first movie. He couldn't just do a retread of what we'd seen in the first movie. So he's come back and uh, really given a fresh spin to this material, and I'm absolutely sure we'll all be back and scared to be jabbers by a third installment in the, in the, in the series. So thank you for uh, watching the movie again, so supporting Premier Asia and watching Jew on the Grudge 2. I certainly, I would say enjoy because these films really are, I mean, sitting here alone in the uh, dubbing studio, I don't necessarily feel that comfortable when I watch these films about walking back alone late at night to go home. Um, so think of me and wish me well. Big thanks to Aya, Aya Sasagawi, who is my... Um, uh, help, was my a great help for me in translating names on these on this film. Uh, I have a lot more luck with the Chinese uh, movies that we talk about, but for the Japanese one, I need a special assistant. I as a, an air hostess with Cathay Pacific, good friend, and she came in and devoted some wom not man hours, some woman hours, to going over the film with me, finding out some of the Japanese names. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you for your continued support. Bay Logan signing off. Sayonara. <laughs>